to this. Welcome everybody to this year's public lecture to mark UK Disability History Month. This is a joint venture between uh, Manchester Met, uh, specifically the Cultures of Disability Research Group, and the Minority Histories Research Group, and the Classics Association. And for that, we thank April Pudsey for um, being a co-organizer of this. For the purposes of audio description, I am a white woman with blonde hair and reddish lips. I'm in front of a bookcase um, and a banner advertising cultures of disability. We have a BSL interpreter tonight um, and she will be live interpreting Dr. Adams's lecture and she will also be available throughout the Q&A. Um, captions have been enabled. Um, I'm afraid they're just automatically generated captions. Um, but yeah, you can access them. Now, if when Ellen gets underway, you want to make Liz the interpreter bigger, um, I've been told that what you do is you click, there's sort of a line between the PowerPoint um, and Liz, and you click on that line and you can drag it to make Liz bigger. So for those of you who may not be familiar with Zoom, that's a way to get the interpretation bigger while Ellen is talking. The talk will take around 45 minutes and then um, Dr. Adams has very kindly agreed to take questions afterwards. Uh, we will ask you either to put your hand up or to write your question in the chat, depending on what you prefer. Liz is very happy to interpret either way. So um, if you're a BSL user, feel confident to ask your questions, please, in BSL, if you wish. Okay, so that brings us to the main event, which is Dr. Ellen Adams. We are delighted to be joined by Dr. Adams today from King's College in London. Um, she is a reader in classical archeology span and liberal arts at the King's College in London. And she's currently researching how classics can engage with disability studies. Not only has this led to publications, but uh, she's particularly interested in the experiences of blind, partially sighted and deaf people in museums. And this has prompted her to develop um, some new ways of engaging people in museums. Her projects have recently included Access All Senses events, um, which she has held at the Court Hall Gallery and the British Museum in London. And she's recently been working on a project in Scotland, Scotland, sorry, at Holyrood Park with Historic Scotland. And she'll be talking a bit about that tonight. Uh, you can find out a bit more about the um, network, uh, in particular her Museum Access Network for Sensory Impairment, Mansill, uh, which is at mansill.uk. So with that, I shall... Um, make myself small, stop my video, um, and hen hand over to Ellen, who will be sharing her screen and her PowerPoint. Thank you, Ellen. Well, thank you, Ros, so much for the invitation. And I'm um, very excited to be here. Um, and thank you to all for coming out. For the purposes of audio description, I'm a white woman wearing glasses in my 40s, and I've got um, bobbed, slightly frizzy, curly, um, brownie, ready hair. Um, I'm going to be sharing my screen so you can see a PowerPoint. You should be able to see a PowerPoint now. And um, a little bit further on, I'm going to be um, showing you a video that's online. Um, so just to introduce myself um, a little bit more, I'm a small D deaf BSL learner, um, and I've been collaborating with capital D deaf people um, for this project. So it's uh, slightly deliberately as part of the Hollywood Park um, project, you've got me um, interviewing um, and Robert Adam, who's a, a wonderful signer, uh, me with my clunky learners um, guys and him. He's a sort of Alan Rittman, um, um, easy, wonderful, almost poetic uh, signer. Uh, so you can see the contrast between the kind of learning BSL and the natural grassroots um, uh, capital D. Um, um, and the capital D is, is more um, to do with the fact that BSL is the first and preferred language um, for that community. 
Um, so that, that's enough about me. I, I want to give some background before I'm, I'm going to be focusing on the Holyrood Park project. Um, and I, 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 I felt the need to sort of unpack this a lot to talk a bit about the background of my research. Um, and also to talk about some of the laws that have taken place that mean that cultural institutions, museums and so on might want to think um, a bit more about how they use and promote BSL in um, their locations. So um, with deafness itself, um, we come a long way in our understanding of what it is. It's a sensory and communication disability. And not so long ago, it, it was confused with cognitive disabilities. It was it was felt that, you know, there, there was um, an IQ or an learning um, difficulties related to deafness. We now understand it that, that yes, you have less hearing, but also it um, does uh, provide hear, uh, hurdles with spoken language as well. Um, some of the terminology is a bit sensitive or delicate. I'm quite relaxed about using the word impairment and um, other people may may um, uh, not be quite so happy with that. Hearing loss is sort of a rather negative way of phrasing it. Um, and something I will be talking about is this phenomenon called um, deaf pride or uh, deaf gain, where um, the, the recognition that if you have a... Um, um, a, a lesser uh, sense or um, an impaired sense, then that 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 is compensated for in other ways, and there's something uh, to really enjoy and relish from that. Um, so, from my point of view, and and there's there's a lot of spinning plates in this. Um, uh, that there's my research question, which is essentially about how this visual spatial language helps us relate to visual art in a different way, even an enhanced way from the linear spoken language that we're all kind of um, um, using mostly on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's true to say, even with my clunky uh, intermediate plus BSL, um, it, is, um, it is very freeing. And sometimes when I'm signing, I go back to English, it does feel a bit like putting a straight jacket back on because you have to use one word at a time. Um, and it's, it's just not as um, uh, embodied fun or the rest of it. So it's plain deaf and capital D deaf. Um, another thing, I mean, there, there is an activist side to this, although I'm very much focused on the um, academic side um, in my work. But there is there are politics involved in what um, what should be done about including people and how access events should uh, be run. And as you as you might expect with any group of people that happens to be categorized together on the on the definition of of a disability there's a lot of variety in terms of preference so with access events that museums are putting on uh do you um adapt the mainstream events so that everyone can join in or do you have separate segregated events that are purely focused um for that particular group uh do you integrate into the mainstream or uh do you attempt a mainstream um, um, event that everyone feels generally included. And something when I come to talk about the Holyrood Park um, project, it's trying to please everyone. And I think um, from initial feedback I've got, I think that, that that's actually um, uh, uh, lending itself to the problem of not being very clear about what it's doing and who it's for and so what it's meant to be for everyone uh so um we, we are and i come to explain it in the process of tweaking how it's presented to people um incorporation into mainstream provision and i think i think you know a crucial thing that you you will get quite a lot of from this talk is this shift from access where uh, people with um, sensory impairments are um, given a version of what's happening in the main world through um, and the audio description or touch tools or British Sign Language tools, and given a much more um, active, 
um, agency role in what's going on. So rather than being a sort of passive receivers of access, of actually uh, becoming uh, some of the decision makers and some of the um, uh, key figures in um, what museums do. Um, okay, my my screen has oh, it froze a little bit there. Um, so what I've been doing is, is having a lot of fun experimenting. And with all experiments, um, what's important is to um, take time to uh, reflect on what's happened and think about the weaknesses as well as the strengths. But it's, it, what I'm doing is a whole series of events. And at the end of this talk, I'll explain uh, what I want to do next. And hopefully the feedback from this stage will help inform um, future um, um, events as well. And this all started in 2017-18 uh, uh, with a series of um, events that was um, alluded to um, in various museums where I um, um, kind of took over a space with the museum's permission um, for a pop-up event where um, we had audio describers and uh, British Sign Language uh, deaf-led tours with an interpreter uh, dotted around, in this case, the Parthenon Galleries of the British Museum, I'm a classicist, um, and the idea was to provide this for mainstream visitors, so for hearing sighted people, and to see what these modes of communication could do to enhance their experience of the stories of the Greek myths or um, no, um, other other various uh, things, um, or th just the information given to see whether um, museums could consider opening up uh, these very specific specialised uh, uh, provision to a, um, a more mainstream group. And the audio description, it's just completely separate talk, but that's interesting in itself, especially if you're a classicist and you're used to exorcists and um, all of the um, translation of the visual to the verbal, all of the uh, literature on that. I'm gonna focus on British Sign Language today. Uh, that, that's quite enough for um, one uh, talk, I think, but just to kind of, mentioned that the feedback from these events were um, they're, they're, they're a fair number of people engaged, so over 60, are very positive. Um, they, uh, they said they had a greater awareness, maybe I should have used the word awareness, um, of BSL from the events, uh, whether they had encountered it before or not, because there were some deaf people um, there as well. And comments on what you might imagine from uh, the benefits of BSL, the drama, the embodied description of it, um, something more interactive so you feel more connected, um, visual learner, then if you are receiving information in this way uh, with the audio voiceover, then um, they said that this would really, this really helped them grasp what's happening and, and would help them remember the story better. Um, and also some of the cinematic impacts of, of BSL, the way you can zoom in and out, uh, different viewpoints being given. Um, you see the world with different eyes, basically. Um, and it, it, it was felt from this experience that this was a good way of introducing deaf people and BSL to uh, people who hadn't had any reason to mix uh, in previously. Um, and this is this is where the law, where we sort of come to that in a moment, where that kind of comes in. Final uh, point of feedback um, is that one comment was made that, um, OK, I've got more of an awareness of BSL, but I don't really understand how it works. This, this event hasn't told me, um, you know, how the language works. I haven't, you know, really got any details on that. Uh, and that explains the language notes to the Holyrood Park project that um, I'll be coming to later. This is sort of the stimulus for setting those up. Um, a little bit of law. I'm slightly obsessed with the law. I think it's um, um, a fascinating thing. And it's it's changed sort of halfway through my life. Or As a young adult, I, I was about 
was 20 or something when the 1995 Disability Discrimination Act came in. Before that point, disabled people didn't have rights as such, but they did have um, certain provisions given. It was, it was done on the charity model that it was felt that disabled people should have, be entitled to certain provisions. But because it was the right thing to do, it's a nice thing to do, there wasn't a sense of there being rights, human rights, that didn't come till 1995. So before that point, you had to be very grateful to get something or you were, uh, or you witness uh, discrimination. Um, then in 2003, BSL was recognised as a language. Um, and it's relatively recent that any sign language was recognised as such, sort of 1960s. Uh, was when um, American Sign Language, someone sort of sat down and, and realised that there, there was a linguistic structure, there was syntax, grammar, um, there are rules, very strict rules about how it works. So it has to be defined as a language. Um, and then 2010, the Equality Act, what, what that seemed to do, it didn't really change the Disability Discrimination Act, but it reinforced it and it made it more visible because it set it up against um, other human rights or civil rights um, issues. The really big thing from our point of view is the 2015 BSL Scotland Act. Um, and this took uh, took BSL to a new place, a bit, a bit like how Welsh is in Wales, where the, the expectation is that everything is bilingual and you, you will see Welsh everywhere. There, there's this meant to be a sort of similar uh, sense with this um, and we're going to look at that um, a little bit later. The um, main point here is that very recently this year Westminster passed a similar BSL Act. Uh, so this gives uh, new duties or new impetuses on um, museums and other uh, cultural sectors. Um, what is the BSL Act? Don't worry, you haven't come to the wrong lecture. I'm not going to spend long on this. Uh, I just want to uh, point out that it's, it's deliberately vague and it, it kind of hangs on the uh, term of promotion and facilitation of the use of British Sign Language and how government departments have to uh, be seen to be doing this. Um, and I find the wording here very interesting because facilitation for me is quite straightforward. This is... Uh, the access that we will all be familiar with, this, the idea that you provide BSL interpreters, um, as we have here, uh, that, um, you know, um, access to um, all aspects of life are facilitated for deaf people. I'm much more interested in the word promotion because this feels to me, um, facilitation is quite passive, okay, you get access. Promotion is to my mind, uh, something rather more um, active, where you spotlight BSL, you celebrate it, you encourage it. It's much more active to my mind. So, um, and, and this is um, um, also seen in, in further guidance here, again, the promotion and facilitation of the use of British Sign Language. And I would just draw attention to 2C here, where it says case studies to illustrate the value of providing British Sign Language interpretation um, in common. Can't read the rest of it because I've got uh, people over in, in communication with the public. Um, so this, this kind of gives people an excuse to spend time doing projects like the one I'm going to show you. It's also, there is um, a good incentive, if you can afford resources, time as well as money, uh, to, to think about um, doing this. An interpretation of this law from the British Deaf Association website um, is um, highlighting the fact that there is um, BSL participation in how this actually acts out. Um, examining how government might increase the number of BSL interpreters, there really aren't enough. Um, and also uh, to, to consider how the government can further facilitate and promote BSL. Um, what I'm showing you now is um, the um, um, 
page from the website of the BSL Scotland Act 2015 page, where it's, it's very difficult to read, I apologise for that, but it's basically broken it down into lots of different chapters, uh, aims and objectives that I suspect COVID has really knocked off course. Uh, but here we see... Um, uh, aims to enable BSL users to take part in culture and the arts as participants, audience members and professionals to support professional pathways to enable BSL users to consider a career in culture and the arts. And I think this goes actually quite a lot further than just saying, oh, OK, we'll provide access by um, having uh, BSL interpretation so that you can experience what the hearing people are experiencing. Um, why why would everyone gain from um, having more visible deaf BSL in mainstream life? Um, it is a, a kind of parallel community. It's a very strong community based on language. It's a linguistic minority. Um, and um, it, from my research interest, um, thinking about communication with visual material culture, just like having a deaf PSL um, actor on stage works incredibly well. And Shakespeare's Globe is doing this a lot, um, where there's just a BSL actor who happens to be signing in among a um, a hearing speaking uh, cast and it works incredibly well. It's exciting. Um, and the actors in those cases are using quite a lot of visual vernacular, which is um, neither mime nor pure BSL. It's sort of somewhere in between. Um, and I, I, I think the theatre is, is leading the way on this. And I am interested in how this can be transferred to the museum sector. Um, whether, it, you know, it would work or, or not. Um, so it's a visual language uh, with a potential for iconicity and mime and visual vernacular. It's got potential for that, but it isn't the same thing. It's not mime. Um, but there's a, you know, the best, the most performative BSL does have mime in it, but it's it's linked within a structure. So it, there's, you know, it's it's quite important to keep the two ultimately separate. And there's various um, aspects to the grammar that we'll come to in a moment that I um, think are very exciting, like role shift when the signer becomes the different characters. Like in English, you have direct speech, you know, quotation marks, and you might be reading different characters speaking, um, where the signer can um, um, kind of uh, indicate that with changes in uh, body uh, uh, posture and eye gaze and uh, just general pose and gesture. And it's also got the uh, cinematic elements that I mentioned um, before. It's a spatial language. So this is your canvas. This is your um, um, your signing space that Liz is um, um, brilliantly um, illustrating uh, for me there. And uh, you, you can reproduce a scene in front of you. You can place people, objects, things, animals, institutions, anything you like in front of you. And the observer will note, note that, keep it in their mind, and you can come back to that feature later. And this can get quite complex. Um, you can have spatial verbs where rather than saying I asked you, you would just do it that way and then this way as you asked me. So you're using space grammatically. Um, so there's there's something, there must be a way of um, thinking about objects differently when you're communicating about them using this um, language. Right, uh, this is my main case study of the day and it's slightly work in progress. Um, it's been a brilliant, really, really wonderful project with um, Sally Gall, especially, uh, but Historic Environment Scotland have been um, great in facilitating this. Note that it's Scotland. Um, it, that's not an accident. They've had the BSL Act for longer. They've been thinking about what does promoting BSL mean? And this was a sort of meeting of minds um, and um, so on. The, I'm going to be talking mainly about the um, website today, but it is an embodied project as well. There will be QR codes placed in the park very soon, I believe, uh, so that you can um, 
get the videos from your phone when you're actually visiting the site. Um, and something that will be added very soon, the voiceover, they were recorded only today. Um, and they are going to be added to the videos um, very soon. So it's a soft launch. It, it's still being tweaked. There are some things like feedback I've already had from a, a capital D deaf friend um, saying that it, it wasn't clear what the purpose was and who this um, um, um website was for. Um, so I think we need to work harder in the introduction to make people welcome and um, make sure that people know what's in store for them and what, what it's trying to do. So it is, is so it's perfect time to get feedback on it, actually. And there is a link to a survey on the website. Um, if you scroll down to the bottom of each of the uh, web pages on it. And I'd be incredibly grateful if you could fill in these anonymous um, um, forms. So I first met Sally um, from Hess uh, in 2017 or 18, it was. Um, and we started to think about what, um, what activities, what project, project we would do. We shared some uh, aims and objectives. Um, this keyword promote, you know, how can museums and heritage sites promote the aims of the BSL Act, which in turn is meant to promote BSL, create heritage without boundaries, um, explore how uh, museums can um, be used to show showcase BSL to hearing people, um, and to think about BSL as a mode of communication for visual culture and to empower deaf people by having them run events, uh, audiences of which may include um, hearing people as well as deaf people. Again, this is, this is as many things are, slightly political. Um, some uh, deaf people are, are, would very much prefer the segregation, the separation of the deaf um, experience and not have it sort of uh, folded into um, hearing experience. But that's not everyone um, thinks this. As with any community, there's a, there's a variation of views. So the first thing we wanted to do was to plan a workshop. And uh, this was going to invite uh, lots of people, Solar Bear is an example um, in Scotland, of people, um, deaf people using BSL being trained in theatre studies and as actors. And uh, we were going to target them, invite them to come along and think about the challenges of doing BSL tours in um, um, heritage sites. And, you know, to see whether they fancied running uh, tours themselves. Uh, note the date and reader know this, this event did not happen because uh, COVID uh, cancelled it. Um, and uh, what we can do is have this workshop. Um, I'm actually going to flick over that because it's, it's not really that important. And then have an event in July 2020 that didn't happen either, even though it's outdoors and all the rest of it. I mean, as deaf people and mask wearing don't mix. Uh, so, it, it, you know, it was it was difficult from that point of view as well. Um, we we had to rethink everything. And, and this is one of those weird examples of maybe COVID did us a favour because uh, we, we turned to doing something that was that would be um, accessible via QR codes and also online. Uh, it would then be permanent. And then I, I was sort of thinking back to this piece of it's a single piece of feedback that said um, it's really opened up awareness of BSL, but I didn't feel it really helped me understand how it works and, you know, any better. Um, so I thought, why don't we add language notes? Um, so what you see in the in the video in a moment is me interviewing uh, Robert Adam, who's um, a deaf BSL linguist, uh, to explain what's happening in the videos with, with reference to particular um, language notes. Let, let's have a look at the structure of what I mean. Um, so what you see here are the four stories that we selected. And the, again, uh, historic environment um, in Scotland were really helpful. The Rangers talked to me about which um, the, the tours that they do and which stories would be 
um, really useful, really good uh, to work with for the BSL ones. Um, and these are the four we selected, um, a piece about St Anthony's Chapel, the Holyrood Coffins, which are now in the um, Museum of Sco um, Scotland, the geology, and David and the Stag. This is the reason why Holyrood has the name it does. Um, so uh, we asked Trudy, who I believe is with us today, which is absolutely brilliant, um, to uh, do BSL performances, videos of uh, these stories, and they're about three minutes long each. And then um, with my learning BSL um, school book uh, to hand, I sort of went through and um, selected particular grammatical notes from each of the stories, so three from each of the four, and which I, I personally find uh, really interesting, like you know, how you use space to place things, placement and BSL, uh, how you use timelines, um, you know, the different different five different lines of depicting time, um, and generally how you create atmosphere and things like that. So the idea was that I and my learners keen to um, know more uh, BSL interviewed uh, Robert, Robert Adam, and he uh, gave examples from the videos of um, each of these um, grammatical um, aspects. So that's the logic. And I don't think it's very clear when you go initially on the website. We do need to explain more. Um, that, that's understood. Um, but I think I think now um, it would be good to actually watch one of these uh, videos if I can do the technology. Um, basically, showing Trudy Trudy Collier in action, and she. I, which one? I, I, the story I'm going to show you is the uh, Hollywood Coffins one. Just see if I can. And just to warn you, there is no, you should be seeing the um, web page now. There's no voiceover yet. That was literally being recorded today. There are captions. Um, having captions alone isn't great because you can't read them and look at Trudy at the same time. So I think for hearing people, it's going to be a lot better when the voiceover is added. So let's see how this goes.
Great. And um, absolutely wonderful um, storytelling there from um, uh, Trudy. And um, what you're, what I'm going to show you now is just one of the language notes, what we got here. I was just trying to get this to work. Um, taking on characters in BSL. OK, so here you can do a com compare and contrast my, my uh, learners at BSL and Robert, who is... Um, a BSL linguist at Heriot Watt University, um, so a specialist in how uh, um, BSL works. And the idea is that I'm a learner and I'm asking him to explain uh, using examples from the video. So this does have a voiceover that you should hear. When they're telling a story, the signer takes on different personalities and characters. Can you explain to me what they're doing? Yes, there are many examples in the film of that happening. Trudy signs different characters, people, dogs, surgeons, grave robbers. For example, the person moves through the landscape, we can see where they are. The way she signs the dog, she becomes like a dog in her character. The surgeons are shown dissecting the bodies. And also the evil grave robbers profiting from their crimes. All of those different characters inside the story and BSL shows the difference between them all. Thank you. Yeah, so um, really, really insightful and um, uh, informative uh, little clips given by uh, Robert. And then if you scroll down to the bottom, there's the all-important um, survey, which is, you know, always um, necessary because we are still tweaking the website and um, there, there are hitches and uh, room for improvement, I think, in, in various ways. Um, excellent. So I've, I've just got another five minutes or so uh, just to um, explain where we're going with this. Um, should have the um, PowerPoint again and um, so basically, I mean, I, I think that uh, the question of who is this for is something that's been on my mind. Um, it's because it's it's meant to be inclusive, i.e. for everyone, and you can end up serving no one if you try and do everything too much. Um, it is meant, it is intentionally for um, anyone who wants to know more about BSL. Uh, this is mainly going to be hearing people. It could possibly be um, uh, BSL uh, users who haven't learned linguistics, BSL linguistics formally at any point. Um, so it doesn't need to just be hearing people or anyone with any interest. Um, my particular research interest is how this relates to the study the art appreciation side of um, the research that I do. Um, and again, with audio description, it's kind of easier to do this because there's already the traditional emphasis. Uh, with BSL, it's very new. And, uh, you know, you sometimes I sometimes feel that maybe hadn't been done before for a good reason. Uh, it's not actually a very good idea. But I, I still think that there is something uh, to it. Uh, how you actually test it um, is, is not um, entirely clear. But one thing that is undoubtedly the case is that um, I, I've noticed that when um, uh, when thinking about art objects deliberately through these different modes of communication, and there you see Edward um, Richards, who's who's one of the uh, deaf tour guys that that I've worked with, uh, with an interpreter giving a voiceover in the British Museum, giving a tour to um, whoever's around and interested. Um, I, I found that I, I, I watching them and uh, listening to them, I found that I was thinking about um, the positioning of the object in the museum in um, much more critically, by, layer by layer. Uh, so, for example, um, thinking more directly about how it was displayed, um, what's actually there, the space you're in. So when you're giving an audio description, for example, you should describe the space and um, the um, all of the sensory 
um, um, elements of being in that space. The dis display context of so the lighting, uh, the labeling, uh, what's actually there and what's missing. Um, and I think that one, it's quite easy. I think the brain naturally kind of fills in gaps. So if you look at a, a statue like the reclining statue there with the missing hand, um, it, it's it's the brain kind of fills it in for you quite often. Um, so um, actually focusing on what isn't there and what has been preserved. And then the compositional context of um, the fact that this may be Dionysus because he may have been holding a uh, cup in his hand. It's sort of basically holding up um, a toast. Um, it's a bit tricky to say, but I, I do think that thinking about objects using different modes of communication does um, contextualize them differently, very deliberately in some ways and accidentally in others. So there's definitely a value to uh, taking your time to do this. Um, oh yes, this is the, please uh, complete the survey. Um, and what next? Um, well, I, I've already done these events in the British Museum. Um, the British Museum itself has a series of BSL videos. Um, and if you go to the um, frontline desk and ask for them, in, Inevitably, the batteries will be flat in them, but um, they do exist. Um, and uh, they have uh, several figures. Clive Mason is a famous uh, BSL uh, figure, um, giving little stories um, 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 from the Greek myths, from the um, various different finds of the British Museum. Um, and I want to do something similar to the Holyrood Park um, project uh, based in these galleries um, as part of an ongoing project, because I am a classicist and um, I, I, being a classicist is relevant because much of the uh, stigma, much, much of our um, understanding of how senses work, how sensory impairments work and how people with sensory impairments um, should be treated indirectly or directly comes from the classics because it's had such a uh, massive impact in the 18th, 19th and into the 20th century. It's really sort of shaped our cultural thinking as well in Britain. Uh, so it does make sense to uh, go back to that. I'm going to, um, uh, and so I'm going to be working with a uh, deaf performer on something similar with, with some uh, tweaks, for example, if there is an interview with the uh, BSL linguist or a BSL linguist, then I think it might be between the um, linguist and the uh, BSL performer talking about uh, the use of language in that particular instance. So there's other ways of doing it. I'm going to skip over that uh, slide because it's not directly relevant and I want to finish in a moment. Um, this is the other uh, third project that I'll be doing. So we're, we're changing scale. We started in the landscape and we did a monument and now we're doing single objects, the wonderful Minoan snake goddesses. And this is going to be focusing on the replicas that are housed in the Ashmolean Museum. Um, they are uh, setting up a uh, an exhibition on Knossos that starts 10th of February. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to be doing um, some um, AD audio description and BSL uh, videos and audios uh, to accompany that. And it's going to be of a similar thing of exploring this idea of um, telling the story in the uh, cultural setting of getting the information across, uh, but happening happens to be using this um, alternative mode of communication that is already established in access work um, and also thinking about how uh, this might benefit all, enhance all um, experience as well as um, promoting um, the BSL in this particular case as well. Uh, this is you no know, just just explaining myself for talking about Hollywood Park when I'm meant to be a classicist. It, it, it is all interlinked, and um, much of much of the sort of ableism that I am um, I hope politely pushing back against does stem from the classical 
tradition. So I'm I'm kind of you know working from within, uh, so to speak. Uh, we're using disability studies and museum studies. Museums are a great platform for this kind of thing. Um, I've already explained the classical legacy and how doing this through the uh, museum practice. So it, it's essentially working with people with sensory impairments, um, you know, taking to the full extent the idea that if you give people agency, it might really shake up uh, what it means to um, uh, uh, explain and uh, work with the objects in the museum. Um, so working with um, the different communication modes, audio description, touch tools, and British sign language tools. Uh, that's essentially what I've been up to. Nothing about us without us is the disability mantra. And lots of groups have used it, but uh, it does feel pertinent because the, the, the tendency is to help disabled people, which means kind of taking over the narrative, kind of getting in control of what happens. So actually, um, changing what you do to accommodate preferences uh, the other way is, is the next stage, um, I think. And also uh, acknowledging that uh, you are not at a loss necessarily if you have uh, less of a particular sense or two. Uh, you The way in which you navigate around this has value of its own and, and, and really does. So there's different ways of beholding art and it's high time to um, acknowledge these uh, different ones. Um, I also wonder also in the rather depressing economic times that we, we live in, whether, uh, and this is political because access budgets need to be protected, um, ring fenced, and it needs to be made sure that uh, the groups they're intended for are prioritized at all times. Uh, but nonetheless, if we can roll it out to more mainstream um, uh, audiences, then that makes for a better business case. It's all about business cases in universities as well uh, for expansion and um, having more of this so that it's normalised to have audio description uh, here. It's normalised to have a tour that happens to be given by a, a deaf person rather than a hearing person. Um, and also, I mean, a, a, a thing that's really struck me is that there's currently, I'm sure it will change and probably quite soon. There's very little dialogue between uh, what's happening in uh, universities with art appreciation and so on, and what's actually happening in practice in the museum sector. Um, so I think there's a lot of room for bridging um, that gap. So a little reminder of the um, website, uh, slightly out of date now, um, that I run and finally um thanks uh for this opportunity to um um show uh, the hollywood project in particular and hope for um some feedback so we can you know incorporate those into the tweaks uh historic environment scotland sally girl has been absolutely wonderful the filming also was absolutely brilliant um santi who did the filming is 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 just uh brilliant trudy and robert for their fantastic contributions and um you know i i absolutely adore uh the work that they did um so that's uh it from me you did get a bit of classics in there so uh not that much though i must admit but there will be more to come so if you want to help um shape the future projects then please do um let me know thank you thank you so much um ellen and you may see in the chat there's lots of congratulations